So presentations are starting now. If you're in this room, you're doing mine all about harvesting, or if you should be somewhere else, please go ahead to that room. Otherwise, hello, good afternoon, how are you guys? Good, I get the post-afternoon lunch break nappy crowd. <laughs> no problem, I'm loud and exciting, I think, so hopefully we'll get you woken up. Um, so today we are learning all about harvesting. We're gonna go over a lot of different things. Again, I only have 30 minutes to get all my information to you, so hopefully I could squeeze it all in. And then we have a five minute question and answer at the end. So, harvesting basics. So it's really important when you start planting to anticipate your harvest right at that point. Um, and a good way to do that is to know what you actually want and when you want it. Um, I should have put pumpkins on here, but basically pumpkins take almost 100 days to grow. So if you want pumpkins for Halloween, you need to be planting those in July or so. Um, and most people don't realize that. In September, they want pumpkins for Halloween, and it's not going to happen that quickly. So it's really important to just have a time frame. Seed packets are excellent resources. They say on there exactly the days to harvest. Um, here in the desert, things take a little more time. Uh, so add a little bit of time. There should be at least about a 20% cushion. If it, says, if it says 80 days, give it about 95 to make sure that you have enough time. Um, so in general, Roots take about 60 to 100 days, depending on the type of plant you're planting. Carrots take closer to 100. Uh, beets can be ready in about 60 days. Uh, radishes are the fastest at about 30 days to harvest for certain, certain varieties. Um, fruits, like zucchinis, can take about 50 to 60 days. And then uh, also peas and beans fall in that category as well, 50 to 60 days. And lettuces and other greens can take about 50 days till you can start harvesting. So starting to harvest on lettuce is a little bit different, but we'll get into the greens later. So uh, a lot of things will affect your harvesting times, uh, but in general, your seed packets will give you a really good basis. So as long as you're reading your seed packets, you should have all the information you need to plant and harvest. Um, and the number one thing, just don't be afraid to harvest. You're never going to learn if you don't just start pulling things out of the ground. Um, so just start harvesting. Uh, even if you make mistakes at the beginning, that's what's going to teach you the most. So seeds, very fun to harvest. Um, if you have a green or planet garden, pretty much all the farmers leave a lot of plants to go to seed since a lot of people never really see carrot seeds or lettuce seeds. So you'll usually have a few of those in your garden. Uh, seeds typically are either dry harvested or wet harvested. Wet harvested is in fruit. That's pretty easy to find. It's in juice. So those usually you want to wash them off, let them dry before you package them. Any other seed, you typically just want to let it dry right on the plant. That way you know the seed's gotten all the information it needs from the plant. It's completely ripe and it is ready to be planted once it's completely dry. Plants are engineered to actually create their seeds and let, let them go when it's time to plant those seeds. So once the seeds start falling out of the packets, it's usually time to start planting them as well. One plant can make hundreds of seeds, if not more. Uh, so don't let all your plants bolt. One single carrot can actually make a thousand seeds. Um, so just let one carrot go to seed. You don't need to harvest all the rest of your carrots. Make sure you're using them. When you're storing seeds, it's really important to store them in a cool, dry place. Uh, any humidity will create uh, mold or mildews. Uh, I like storing them in paper packets rather than in plastic, uh, just for that reason as well. Okay, how to harvest greens and herbs. So I have a few different displays here. I have a lettuce plant I dug up from my garden this morning. Uh, it actually started to bolt because it's getting warm, so I got some from the hydroponics unit downstairs. So when you're harvesting lettuce or other greens, any green that comes in a bunch, kales and things like that, you can either harvest the heads, which means chopping it down, or you can do the cut and come again method, which would be harvesting all the largest leaves and leaving the um, rosette, I think it's called, in the middle to continue growing. And what happens, this will actually keep growing as well, but since you don't, you didn't leave a lot of greens on it, it's not gonna gather as much of the sun's energy to grow as fast as this one will. This one will turn it back into this size in about a week. So the cut and come again method allows you to have lettuce continuously until it starts to finally bolt, in which case it's too bitter. 
if you're harvesting it down to the ground, you may not get that uh, much lettuce regrowing before it gets too hot to keep growing again. So I definitely recommend the cut and come again method, but as long as you're harvesting at all, that will always be better than nothing. So uh, you can see the amount of lettuce I got from the cut and come again harvest right here compared to cutting off the entire head, and it's very similar. So as long as you have an extra couple minutes to do the actual snapping off of all the leaves all the way around, um, I always recommend snapping over cutting. You would just go all the way around, snap off all the biggest leaves all the way around. Perennial herbs need to be trimmed back completely once a year to keep them fresh and growing healthy and to stop them from getting all woody. So an easy way to do that is to just harvest heavily throughout the year so that you don't have to cut off a bunch of uh, mangy growth at the end. If, you, if you're just harvesting a lot of it throughout the year, you won't have to cut it back completely. Um, but Perennial herbs are anything that will stick around for many years. Uh, rosemaries, lavenders, sage, uh, pretty much any herb that will develop a woody base uh, is a perennial herb. Things like parsley, cilantros are the annual herbs that need to be planted yearly, so those are good for seed collecting. But perennials, um, in order to keep them looking fresh and producing nice healthy growth, you want to trim them back a lot. If you are trimming back your plants a lot, just have a plan in place. If you're trimming back your rosemary a lot or your lavender a lot, ha uh, make sachets, you know, do something with the harvest because it's still usable. Okay, fruits and legumes. Um, I should have had a picture for this, but I couldn't find a very good one. So on watermelons or any other kind of melon or winter squash, any kind of large vining plant, um, the pumpkins also, the where the plant connects to the vine there will actually be a little curly vine and that would be where in nature the plant would climb and hold on to uh, trees because those plants d evolved so that when the seeds are ripe and ready that curly cue would dry and release the watermelon or pumpkin to smash on the ground <clears throat> and that's how those seeds are supposed to be spread in nature so once the curly cue is completely dry you know your fruit is ripe because that's when the plant has, has developed to, in order to um, spread its seeds. So uh, as long as your curly cue is completely dried up, your watermelon or your pumpkin is ripe. If your curly cue is still green, it, your fruit is not gonna be completely ripe. So that's always an easy way to tell on those larger plants. Um, summer squashes and cucumbers, pretty easy. You harvest at the size you want. Uh, not a big problem. They're good at any size and the larger they get, the less the, the, the less uh, tender they are. So the larger they are, you usually have to cook them a little bit longer. Um, peas and beans, harvest as much as possible. The more you harvest, the more you, the, your plant will produce. A plant's only goal is to make seeds. Peas and beans are the plant seeds. So if you're taking them off, the plant's gonna keep making them because that's all it wants to do. So the, har the more you harvest, the more you'll get. Um, let's see, roots. Roots are pretty much the easiest to harvest. Uh, each seed makes one single root, so you get one carrot. Uh, they'll usually push themselves right out of the ground when they're ready. You'll see the top of the carrots. You'll see like half the radish popping up. You'll see the top of the beet. Um, if you have really fluffy soil, sometimes that won't actually happen. But if you just brush a little bit of soil over, you'll see the top of the root. And once it's looking like a very good size, that's when it's time to harvest. The best way to harvest roots is to grab all the leaves. If you're only pulling like half the leaves, they'll usually rip off off, leave the root behind, and you'll have to pull it out using the other half of the leaves. That, uh, onions is included in that? Onions, yeah, yeah, onions as well. Um, onions are actually very interesting because you can leave them to store in the ground. Uh, they're ready to harvest once the greens are completely dried up. So onions are nice because you can use those leaves as green onions as they're growing, and once those green onions start to try to dry up completely, you know the onion root is ready and you can actually just leave it on the ground until you're ready to use it. That's where I store my onions. <laughs> um, don't forget the leaves of all your roots are edibles. Our, uh, carrot leaves are great. Beet leaves are fantastic. Turnip leaves are some of my favorites. They're all fantastic. The whole plant is great, so use them up. In salads or where? Uh, so it depends on the plant. Uh, a lot of uh, greens on roots, you would want to cook them. Uh, I know a lot of people that put carrot leaves in salads raw, though they just chop them up fine. I think carrots are probably the only one you would, wouldn't really want to cook. Uh, but beetroots, I mean beet leaves, turnip leaves, radish leaves, they're all fantastic, sauteed in a little bit of olive oil with some lemon juice. And 
Finally, wow, I went fast there, sorry. Uh, finally, please just harvest. If you're not harvesting, all these vegetables are just going to waste. When they're ready, it's time to harvest them. Um, a good way to wash root vegetables in the garden is to just bring a pail or any kind of large container of water and just dunk them in there and rub up, rub up all the soil. And that way you can store them clean. Uh, greens want to be washed and dried very thoroughly before you uh, store them. If, they, if there's a lot of moisture left on your greens, they will wilt in the fridge even. Uh, so either don't wash those right away or wash them and dry them really well. I love my salad spinner. I just keep it on my counter. I use it every day. Um, so many things can be done with your harvest. You can do farmer's markets if you have a lot coming in at once. If you just have a couple things, you can send it home with the students. Uh, you can send them washed in bags. You can maybe make a salad in class. I've been making salads with some of my smaller classes because uh, they're simple to do. Um, other easy meals like salsas. Um, you can do cooking competitions. If you have one ingredient that's focused in the garden, you can have the kids go home and try to make something using that ingredient and see who's, who did the best. Uh, there's a lot of different ideas with the gardens. So just harvest and make sure you're actually doing it. So I kind of sped through my, my presentation. So uh, hopefully you have a lot of questions for me. <laughs> Yes. You said your lettuce was bolting. How do you know? Yes. So bolting is means the plant is trying to flower and make seeds. And when something like lettuce is trying to bolt, you'll actually see the center stalk more than you would here. Actually, this one doesn't even have a stalk showing. So anytime you see the stalk, basically all that means is that the greens are more bitter. On lettuce, that is an issue. On other things like spinach or Swiss chard, they're kind of bitter to begin with, so you can usually just keep cooking them and using them. Uh, but there is a point where it's not desirable anymore. So any other questions, please? OK, so at our school, we were just more curious about like, I don't know, how to do the whole seed drying process. Like if you could just maybe elaborate a little bit more, like I'm not quite confident. Absolutely, yet. on uh, like in fruit or seeds that are growing on the plant? Uh, just, and yeah, so like we have a lot of things that just recently went to flower, so we kept some of them. And um, I think one of them that we kept, kept to flower was like our cabbage plants. So mm -hmm. how would I go about like taking those flowers to dry it out to have the seed? So the easiest way to have that happen is to actually let the plant dry up in your garden. Uh, the plant has to send all the genetic information over to the seeds and basically when the seed dries up on its own, the, the plant is done doing that. Uh, so if you harvest the seed prior to it drying on the plant, there's a chance it might not have gotten all that information it needed from the original plant. So the best way to do that is to let it dry on the, on the plant. Um, in general, pretty much all your winter plants besides lettuce is going to form seeds in pods. Once they're completely dry, if the birds haven't ripped them up and gotten to them, you open up the pods and harvest all your seeds inside of them. We have Romanesco and cilantro, and they're all flowering. How long should we wait? What, should we just wait till it completely dries up? Yep, wait till okay, it completely Okay, right dries up. Okay, because right now it looks like up. dill. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, I mean, it's, it's not great looking, but it's the best way to allow the plant to fully ripen its seeds. Um, so that's just leave, again, one plant will make hundreds of seeds, so you don't need to leave all your oh, cilantro flowering. One. Just one cilantro plant will make 100 seeds. And our Ruminesco's got like a one-inch stalk. Yeah. <laughs> how, how soon can we start? Should we start harvesting that? Because i I'd never seen it before. So it's it's not flowering just yet? Not yet. It's so just it's, like four feet tall. And it's got these huge, it's this huge stalk and the leaves are still coming off it. This okay. Um is there any 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 flowers happening like the the head at all? Not that we've noticed yet. Okay. So you have to wait till the head actually starts to form because that's the part you eat, but broccoli leaves are actually delicious to eat as well. Okay. So, so, so Romanesco is broccoli? It's it's a cauliflower. They call it broccoli, but it's actually a cauliflower. We don't even know what we have. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> this is that happens. Yeah, have your farmer relabel your garden, maybe. <laughs> that can help. All right. Any other questions? Yes. Um, can we grow potatoes here? Yes, we could definitely grow potatoes. Um, the problem with potatoes is that our soil tends to, because we have such high mineral content in our water, our soil wants to compact. And potatoes need very, very fluffy soil to really form and grow. Um, the potatoes I've planted in garden beds didn't really grow large. And I'm pretty sure that was because the soil is holding them 
to their original size. It's not allowing them to expand. Um, we had another farmer that had a lot of success with leaf beds. So if you have an area in the garden that you could make a leaf pile and that will compost into a really, really fluffy soil that's great for potatoes. Have you and heard? potatoes would be planted in the fall for harvest in the spring. They, oh, okay. Have you right, heard they, of using, cold weather crop. Have you heard of using like a um, tire to do that, like an old inner tube? Yes. So and a lot of people idea use about tires. Um, I get anxious about the contamination possibilities in the soil, so I would recommend tires to be used for ornamental plants and not edibles, especially roots, I think. Like, you just keep piling stuff on top of it? So, uh, uh, good a good way of growing potatoes um, is actually in an old garbage can or a new garbage can, whatever, that you cut the bottom off of and just place it on the soil. And then you start your potatoes in there. And you add, once they start to leaf out, you just continuously add soil and allow the plant to grow because uh, they'll keep making roots as they grow up through the soil you're adding. And then when it's a good time to harvest it at the end, you just lift it off off the ground and everything just falls out the bottom. Because the plant on the top starts to die? Or? Uh, the plant at the top will actually shoot out more potato roots. Oh, okay. So you're creating uh, like a basically a trellis to potato in your soil, if that makes sense. <laughs> I had a question. Yeah. 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 In a garbage can, the bottom cut off is really easy because you just pull it up and pick the potatoes out. I was going to say, we had some. A problem with the sweet potatoes that we grow in our raised beds. So I would uh, caution anyone who does it that it ended up turning over our soil and bringing all the minerals to the top, mm -hmm. and then we had a very hard time growing in those beds. Oh, interesting. So it was it was an experiment, but it's. Yeah, harvesting potatoes and sweet potatoes in a bed is tough because you have to you do have to pull out pretty much everything in there, and it, you're. Of yeah, it is. It is a big hassle in the in the raised beds, but it is very interesting. And kids are good at pulling potatoes out of the soil for sure. So, um, all right. Any other questions? Yes. Have you tried one of those potato grow bags? I have not. I think Farmer Danielle has experience with those. Um, yeah, we would. We would order just five gallon, like a pack of five gallon grow bags um, from Amazon or whatever, and it would be kind of the same idea. So we would um, fill them like a third of the way with soil, put your potatoes in there, cover them with a very little bit of soil, and then they would start to grow and you just keep covering it with more and more soil so they develop more roots. And then same idea, when the leaves yeah. die off, then they're ready to harvest. Yeah, and easy to dump out. Yeah, and then you don't have to worry about damaging your soil structure, yeah. and um, it's a lot easier. Yeah, dumping out dumping out soil that's growing potatoes is way easier than trying to dig out wherever they're growing, for sure. Um, so if there are no further questions, if you guys want to come up and look at these plants and understand more the cut and come again method and the florets and the chopping it down at the base, um, that's definitely a good lesson up here. So, yes. No, never. Because whenever I buy beans, they're dry beans. Mm -hmm. When you pick them to eat, can you eat them fresh? Yes. Yes, so um, unless you're, if you're growing a variety of bean that is typically used dry, like black beans, you actually would want that to grow on, to dry on the plant as well to harvest. Want them to dry yep, yep. If you're use, if you're if you're growing black beans or like soup beans or any bean that you would actually cook dry, you would let it dry on the plant. They are a little tough to eat if you try to eat them fresh. Yeah. Yeah. If they're a dry bean, then they're kind of. Cooked. Yeah. There's certain beans like black beans, cannellini beans, a couple others that they're just typically used dry rather than fresh. Okay. Any other questions about harvesting? We've got a couple. For roses. Roses. Like once, sorry. For the flowers or the once you get a flower and it's time to cut it. I mean, do I cut it off? Wait till it. So a rose, you would actually want pretty much any flower if you're going to cut it for display. You actually want to open it just before it starts to open up because it will open up in your display. Or just to clean up your rose system, oh, to, to make it, it look pretty. I mean, I, so you, you, the roses you would treat like a perennial herb. You would trim it back once a year in the winter. Yep, to encourage all that new growth. I have a question. Yes. Um, what would you say about using harvesting to keep your crops healthy? Absolutely. Thank you for bringing that up. Uh, harvesting for keeping crops healthy. So um, 
when plants grow, they, they tend to want to just take over and they grow very tight. And the, the, uh, the closer they are together, the more habitats you're creating for pests and diseases. So you don't want that. You want to keep your plants all thinned and harvested and clean so that you are getting the best success with them and that you're not encouraging uh, homes for the bad bugs. Thank you. Like I know, I know. <laughs> Yeah, thinning is sometimes horrible, but there is something you can do with everything you heart, you pull out. So um, if you're just uh, removing leaves, you can use those leaves. If you're trimming back herbs, you can use those trimmings. If you're pulling out tiny carrots, those are still usable, even though they're not big. So, I mean, just you can still use those things. You just have to have a plan. Having a plan um, for, for what you're pulling out is always very important. Otherwise, it's too easy to let it just sit there in the fridge or anywhere because you don't really know. So as I'm harvesting, I'm usually developing my plan of what I'm about to do with it. Oh, I have a question. Do you have a use for aloe vera or the little things that come out? out the pups? Uh -huh. So those are actually new baby aloe vera plants. And if you just chop them off and keep some root on there, you can transplant them and they'll become like nice large aloe vera plants as well. Like that tiny, are they Those little big? tiny ones will turn into the big plants, yeah. Are they edible? Oh, um, yeah, people, people eat aloe vera juice. I think what you do is you just scrape all the inside and put it in a blender with a lot of water. So in our garden bed, we just harvested all the lettuce and we cut it down at the base. Mm -hmm. Is it beneficial to leave the roots in the soil and let them decompose in there, or should we dig the roots out before replanting? Before? So as long as it's completely in the soil, I don't mind leaving things for the worms. Anything that's popping up above the soil will create habitat for bad bugs. Okay. So you don't want to leave too much on top, but underneath the soil, don't worry, the worms will have a fun feast there. Can we grow bananas here? Uh, I actually just planted a banana tree that can handle up to negative 20 degrees, or I'm sorry, 20 degrees Fahrenheit. So, uh, apparently so. We'll see how much babying it requires. <laughs> I know several people that have bananas alive in greenhouses. Okay, so could we like turn it, because our house is so, could we spray it enough, could we keep it alive in the house? It needs a lot of sun as well. A lot of sun and a lot of humidity, so as long as you can create those conditions, it should do fine. Um, the, pro the big problem with here with bananas is the humidity, but the cold is the worst because it'll kill all the bananas. So um, I'm new to Nevada, so <laughs> I have so many questions. Um, fruit trees, what about fruit trees here? Fruit trees do very well here. I'm actually surprised at how incredibly well they do here. I'm originally from Florida, so I had a big learning curve uh, learning how to garden here. Um, a grapefruit tree that's growing under a palm tree at my school, mm -hmm. and those are the best grapefruits I've ever seen. Oh, very nice. Yeah, when I look online, you know, I'm thinking about like not only this school but my house, like what, what trees could I plant? It kind of acts like Maybe not so much. Mm -hmm. Yep, I was kind of worried about uh, trees when I first moved here too, and I actually got a lemon tree within a month or two of moving here, and I put it in a pot because I was terrified. And then I started this job and started seeing all these trees at schools and how amazing they were doing, and I immediately put my lemon tree in the ground, and I'm very happy I did <laughs> uh, because it's just going to be stunted in the pot. Trees do great here. Uh, you're going to have to worry about the microclimates. We have a lot of them across the valley. If you're at a very high elevation or if you get a lot of winds, you're going to have to consider what plants can handle your uh, area. Um, but I mean, this is a great climate for growing plants as long as you can provide some extra water. Like it, it doesn't get my school. It's very sandy. Mm -hmm. But where I live, it's maybe rockier. Or mm -hmm. Yeah, we have a very strange uh, sub floor in the valley. Some places in the center of the valley, it was actually springs years ago, so that's very nice soil over there. But then there's other places where they, I think, just put a bunch of fill dirt into. Uh, so who knows what's going on on the ground. But yeah, raised beds is definitely the way to go here. Our ground isn't fantastic. Um, but as long as you can provide water, our climate is great for growing plants. I have such an easier time growing in Las Vegas than I ever did in Florida. Right. It's shocking. <laughs> I, I had no idea. <laughs> avocados. I don't know anyone really growing avocados out here. I think it's a little too dry. Probably our pH is probably a mess for them. Um, but California. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.
Yeah. Okay, any other questions? Man, I really did speed through this too fast. <laughs> yes. Mm -hmm. Microgreens. Do you, have any or you know, so I don't really know too much about microgreens. I've recently heard somebody explain that it's a specific type of seed, which I thought it was just harvesting early. Uh, but then somebody explained to me that it's actually specific plants that they're grown to be small, so you would get microgreen seeds. Oh. Okay. Yeah. Actually, is there a farmer near that knows that? Oh, okay. <laughs> um, Taylor, yeah, Taylor would know that. That's the hydroponics are great with the microgreens. Um, if you take our hydroponics 101 training, they teach a bunch of different um, kits that you can do in your classroom to grow them, and then you could definitely easily grow microgreens. Because they do need a lot of water in the soil. It's going to be a little rough on those. Yeah. Okay, well, um, if there are no further questions, I guess we just have a little... Oh, yes. I saved some apple seeds and I put them in the little paper it's too late for me to plant them now huh or how long can um, I keep them for is it an organic apple uh, some apples may not create a fruiting tree um, some apples the seeds might not even grow uh, if you used an organic apple you'll have the best chance of getting your seeds to grow and even so it's gonna take at least 10 to 15 till years till that tree can make apples since I had them or I saved it uh, maybe now six months, uh, it's st still okay to plant or I mean, um, are they gone So like already? seed viability? So typically you would want seeds to be used within a year and certain plants you really do have to use them within a year. I think cucumbers and some other plants, maybe, maybe tomatoes, but a lot of other plants, especially trees, those seeds can stay viable for years. They just recently sprouted some seeds from a palm tree that's like three or 4,000 years old or something. Wow. So, and it's um, still time for them to be planted since we're already... So are you trying to plant them in the ground because... Um, I was thinking of a little... A tree I mean, just to you would want started. to start it indoors, so it doesn't matter what time you plant it. Oh, okay. Yeah, it's all about when you would put it outdoors. That would Thank be timing. You. Have you ever dealt with squash bugs? Because <laughs> I've had Absolutely. them in my garden and I'm trying not to do any squash because they eat the flowers. Yes, yeah, so last year was an obscenely bad year for squash bugs. I've never seen anything like this. <laughs> um, it was it was kind of disturbing. There were so many squash bugs. Um, so a lot of people wait until after Father's Day to plant squash. They should be coming out right about now, and the theory is that if they starve before uh, you plant your squash, then you won't have a problem with them. But hopefully your neighbors aren't planting squash either, because that's exactly what will happen there, is that all the squash bugs will just come to yours once you plant it, if they're around. So uh, as a whole, I think all of us farmers are generally avoiding squash until after Father's Day this year to try to, and hopefully the snow uh, knocked some of those squash bugs off, because Last year was so bad. <laughs> um, squash bugs are kind of rough. They don't really have natural predators because they're stinky, so the birds don't even eat them. Uh, the best way to attack them is to get them when they're nymphs, and they grow within a week. So uh, you have to get them pretty much right after they hatch, and some soapy water will take them down very quickly. But you have to get them when they're young. Yeah, once they're older, they have a very hard exoskeleton, and it's almost impossible to get them to die. Boy, those squash bugs. Kids are excellent at hunting out squash bugs. That's a good one. <laughs> yeah, I know. That's. I'm really hoping the snow hopefully knocked a good population down because last year was just horrible. So warm winters are great because we it keeps the plants growing, but it also allows the bugs to keep living. So hopefully this winter was cold enough to keep them up. Uh, I have a lot of roly polies. Are those good, bad? So roly-polies generally would be a really good bug. Um, they're a composting bug like the worms. But roly-polies will often run out of food and start eating your seedlings. So if you have too many roly-polies, they can definitely become a problem, especially if you're not seeing anything sprouting. That's usually the culprit. Uh, but just a few roly-polies is great. And I've actually just recently read a study about how they remove uh, heavy metals and toxins out of the soil. Um, so they're actually great at clearing lead out of soil, which is 
Pretty surprising. Roly polies, as a side note, aren't actually a bug, they're a crustacean. They're related to lobsters. <laughs> Harlequin bugs or box elder bugs? Yeah, box elder bugs. Uh huh. I've never seen them this big. I've got some that are huge at my house. Mm -hmm. like, yeah, they're kind of big earlier this year. I noticed that too. Where are they from and what do they eat? Um, so the box elder bugs, they also look like milkweed bugs. One of them has a white spot and one of them doesn't. So the milkweed bugs eat milkweed, which is the host plant to the monarch, if anyone did the pollinator uh, presentation. So the, the, the milkweed bugs will eat your milkweed. Uh, the box elder bugs look a lot like them, but they don't eat the milkweed quite as much. And they don't tend to bother my garden very much. I've never seen them really harming it. Uh, but again, anything that anything you have too much, anything that is has a too big population is going to be a problem usually, so. But they're going to be drawn. We're probably going to have a big one because of all the moisture. Uh, probably, yeah, from all the rains. Yeah, no, oh, that's probably why they're out early this year. That makes sense, yeah. Okay. Any other questions? Otherwise, well, I guess we'll get about a 10 minute break on this one then. Okay, well, thank you guys for having me. And thank you. And again, if you want to come up and check out these lettuces and look at that a little bit further, please feel free.